Joining us now over Zoom is the college basketball stats guru, Ken Pomeroy. His index factors heavily into the NCAA tournament selection process. We're always glad to have him. Ken, welcome back to the program. A uh, belated Merry Christmas and an early Happy New Year to you. Likewise, fellas. Yeah, great to be on. Thanks for having me on again. College basketball season is in full swing. Uh, but before we get to the hard court and basketball, you're a man of many talents. We understand uh, as a former meteorologist, you can help us figure out some things like what in the world a snow squall is because a snow squall hit Utah. And I think everyone on social media was just trying to figure out how to define a squall. Wait, wait a minute. What's a snow squall? Can you help us define what a squall, a snow squall is? Yeah, it's pretty simple. It's just a, a quick burst of, of heavy snow, uh, usually associated with a, a lot of wind. So uh, kind of a unique feature. You know, it's not like one of these deals where it's going to snow for, you know, six or eight hours or something like that. You know, you get one or two hours of heavy snow. So it's a, a brief inconvenience. And uh, and then after that, it's over. So uh, it was pretty cool. It's kind of a new a new type of warning in the, in the weather world. But I think it was used pretty appropriate, appropriately around here the other day. I, I, w- I would uh, I would say so. Uh, let's go from uh, from predicting the weather to predicting uh, some <laughs> basketball. Uh, and right now, Not so B- quick. <laughs> <laughs> let's so so BYU right now, according to your rankings, coming in at number twenty seven. They've got a record of eleven and three. Wrapping up non conference play tonight against against Westminster. What do the numbers tell you about BYU so far this year? Well, they've been they've been pretty solid. I mean, this is kind of the the trademark of a Mark Pope team, it seems like, is that they're not, you know, they're not one of these lopsided teams that's great on one side of the ball or the other, or, you know, necessarily great in any particular category. They're just kind of a, you know, really solid uh, in a number of different areas. So, you know, the offense right now ranks 27th, the defense ranks 37th. Uh, so, you know, they're not necessarily great on either side of the ball, but they're very good. And then when you're very good in a lot of different things, you end up being a very good team. And I think that's, uh, you know, a, a, a safe, uh, observation about uh, who BYU is right now. Ken Pomeroy is with us on BYU Sports Nation. Let's discuss specifics and how you think BYU, according to the numbers, can improve based on what trends you're seeing early on. Where, where do you think that they can improve and will improve as the season progresses, Ken? Well, I think the one wild card for them going forward is the, is the three-point shooting. You know, people are obviously aware of Alex Barcelo and and how great he is in that particular area. Um, he's not necessarily a high volume three point shooter, but you know when he puts it up, it goes in a very high percentage of the time. It's just a matter of getting contributions from from other players in that area. Um, you know, that's where they've really struggled this year, and where the offense bogs down against good teams. It's where uh, you know defenses know they can pretty much help off just about anybody besides Barcelo and, and plug up that lane and make it difficult for BYU to to get buckets inside. So. You know, that's the area going forward where uh, I think they can improve like Tijon Lucas. You think, you know, he can, he can do a little bit better than 32%. You know, the front line, obviously Caleb Loner so far two for 21 and he's not necessarily a great three point shooter, but you know, he's, he's got to do better than that. Seneca Knight nine for 33. Like, you know, you think there's some improvement there. So, you know, if one of those front line guys can start shooting the three, just, uh, you know, an average rate, a 30% rate, something like that, that'll be a big help to the offense and kind of, uh, allow for some more space for, you know, the backcourt guys to operate a little bit and, uh, and, you know, hopefully improve the offense going forward. Ken, obviously one of the major storylines for this team this year has been the personnel issue down in the post with the five guys, whether it's Harward, um, you know, out with the cardiovascular issues, uh, you know, Gavin Baxter with the season ending injury, BYU and Mark Pope said this like we're never going to be the team that we thought we were going to be because we just don't have the same personnel uh, that we started the season with. How has BYU's big man situation changed this team, do you think? I don't know that it's had a, a huge, as big of an impact as you might think. I mean, obviously, you know, the depth up front is affected. And so, um, so that's an issue and, and the team has to play smaller. And I know there's been kind of a big deal made about that, but when you look at their defensive stats, you know, they haven't changed appreciably with those two guys out. Um, one of the reasons is, you know, Fus Traore is, uh, even though he's listed at six, six, he's, he's long and uh, he plays like quite a bit bigger. Like he's, turned out to be the you know the best rebounder on the team um you know the best shot blocker not that these you know 
the Kembe Mutombo out there, but he does, you know, he does block some shots. He does protect the rim a little bit. Um, so, uh, so even though he's listed at six, six, he plays, he plays bigger than that. And, uh, you know, I think it's, you know, BYU fans are really going to enjoy watching him the rest of the year, watching him develop, um, you know, the guy has stepped in and, and, and really been good for them so far. So, um, so obviously the, the frontline loss is hard and you, you know, you'd rather have those guys out there just to have more options, but so far BYU has weathered that storm pretty well. Ken Pomeroy with us on BYU sports nation. It feels like for the last four years running, Ken, I've been hearing, Oh, this is the best the West Coast Conference has ever been. Seriously, running back to 2018, now we're into 2021, almost 2022. Hearing it again, this is the best the West Coast Conference has ever been. Do your numbers back up that statement that this is truly the best WCC top to bottom we've ever seen? And just maybe there might be four teams from the WCC in the tournament. Yeah, it's certainly possible. Uh, so it depends, first of all, how you want to define you know, how good the, the conference is. It's a little different this year. Uh, you, so you do have the, the typical three at the top, you know, Gonzaga, BYU, St. Mary's. They're all, you know, kind of where they usually are. Uh, San Francisco has has appeared to have joined the club and they're ranked 34th in my system right now. You know, finished non-conference at 13 and one. Don't necessarily have any super high quality wins in there, but they, you know, they've beaten a lot of good teams. Uh, so that would be your fourth team in the tournament, theoretically. Um, the, the issue is like the bottom of the league is actually worse than it's been in the past. So instead mm. of having a whole bunch of teams in that 100 to 200 range, now we really don't have any Loyola is the only team ranked between 100 and 200 um, in my ratings right now. Uh, and they've been a little bit disappointing. People thought they might be a tournament team this year. Uh, and then you got, you know, the bottom of the league, like Pepperdine has really struggled kind of replacing some losses from last year. Pacific hasn't been very good. Portland's improved, but they're improved from a team, you know, that uh, was the doormat last year and, and ditto for San Diego. So, um, so the league overall is probably about where it has been. If you just average all the teams, um, I think from a, you know, a glamour perspective nationally they're going to look at those tournament teams and so um so having four tournament teams will help and i, I will say too like the structure of the league probably also helps in getting four teams because you know those bottom teams being worse i mean there's less of a chance of a of an upset during the season that might you know damage the tournament prospects running these four teams so i'm not sure i'm on board with there being four teams like i think you know maybe san francisco or, or st mary's might might struggle and, and drop out of that group but it's certainly possible. I mean, if there's ever going to be a year for four teams from the WCC, this is the year. Let's stay with the conference conversation and push it forward to 2023. I don't believe we've had you on the show since BYU made the announcement that they were going to the Big 12 starting in 2023. And and this obviously, you know, by most is looked at as is the best uh, college basketball conference, you know, in the country. I I'm curious your thoughts of, of this BYU program going and with some other really good basketball programs going into the big 12 and how that looks in 2023. Yeah. You know, it looks pretty promising when, when they made that announcement, I kind of went back and, and ran the numbers on the past uh, five years or so, just looking at, you know, what would have happened if the, the big 12 had, had been composed of, of this new membership where it would have ranked among conferences and it still would have ranked first, you know, it, it had a run there of like six or seven years where it, where it ranked first in my system. Um, the big, 10 took that over the last two years. And then now the big 12 is back on top uh, with its current mem current membership. So um, yeah, even adding the new teams, you know, it, it, uh, it should be, a, it's going to be a very strong conference, you know, uh, just, you just look at the teams this year, you know, obviously Houston, uh, you know, they've just been hurt by, by unfortunate injuries, but uh, up to that point, they were one of the best teams in the country. Uh, Cincinnati, you know, is, has actually, you know, been all right this year. They have, you know, a, a coaching situ new coach situation, but they've, you know, they've been decent this year. UCF has actually been pretty good. I think they're kind of the team that I thought, eh, you know, they're probably not going to contribute much to the league, but they've actually been pretty solid this year. They're ranked 53rd in my system. Um, so, uh, so it definitely looks promising uh, for the big 12 going forward. As long as, you know, those kind of, these kind of non-traditional programs that have risen to the top, like Baylor and Texas tech, if they continue to be pretty good, like that league's going to be really strong by the time BYU arrives. Ken, I know we've asked you this before, but uh, for some of our newer listeners, we want to discuss your relationship with the NCAA and how you got involved with your metric in helping them determine the NCAA tournament team. So uh, first and foremost, what type of interaction do you have with the selection committee uh, at a time like this leading up through March? Well, it really just consists of them uh, using my data like like anybody else does. You know, they, they go to my website and uh, – and print it out and put, you know, somehow they have some way to put the data into their, uh, um, what they call their team sheets or the, you know, the, the pages that all the committee members get to kind of analyze teams. So, um, so that's really how that works. 
you know, my, my interaction with them really started, you know, four or five years ago when they were trying to look to, uh, to replace the RPI, you know, they invited a, a few uh, of us analytics guys to Indianapolis to uh, kind of chat with them and uh, maybe give them some uh, advice on, on how, how they should move going forward. And, um, you know, ultimately they elected to use the net ratings, which um, was kind of their own concoction, but as, as it turns out, is very similar to my ratings. Um, so they primarily rely on the net, but they do have these other systems, uh, including mine that, that they use in the room. And, uh, and, you know, it's obviously an honor, uh, to, to, to be considered, you know, useful enough to be a part of that process. <laughs> <laughs> Don't sell yourself short. Also, RPI still exists in several other sports. And frankly, we're tired of it, like with uh, women's basketball <laughs> and women's volleyball and some other things. So if you want to make a Ken Pomeroy index to help push that out, we're supporting that as well. Yeah, you know, the women's game, I think, did go away from the RPI now, and they are using the net. Um, but you're right. There's no, yeah, outside of uh, basketball, everybody still uses the RPI or something similar. I think hockey uses something a little bit different. But um so I do, you know, people, uh, you know, they kind of rag on the net sometimes and, and, you know, there could definitely be a better system to select postseason participants, but I do give the basketball side credit for, for finally moving away from the RPI. I mean, it was, <laughs> you know, it was invented in 1981 and it was, it actually was really useful back then. You know, there wasn't a lot of computing power and things like that, but obviously society has advanced and uh, it was, it was time to move on to something more useful. You, you know, Ken, I, I'm curious, we're, and we're already seeing this now, even in the West Coast Conference, you know, some games have been postponed due to, to COVID issues. A lot of, of games in the Big 12 have been postponed, a couple more even this morning. I, I'm, I'm curious, how do things change for you in terms of the data and whatnot when you're, and obviously there's still plenty of time for all of this to catch up and maybe all the games do get played, but how, and how much does that change what you do and the data that is there uh, when you may have such a, such a difference between the number of games this team plays versus another and, and that kind of thing? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's not such a big deal in that respect. You know, uh, my system is just going to look at the games that were played and, and rate teams based off of that. So it's not super concerned about, uh, you know, double round robin conference standings or anything like that you know just say hey, who did you play and how good are those teams and how did you do where it really becomes a problem and it's starting to become a problem is that you know the games that aren't canceled uh you know players are out sometimes key players are out and just it, it just seems like from game to game you know it's rare to find a game right now where both teams have a, a full complement of players playing and um, my system is not sophisticated enough to say okay well you know the third best player for this team is out and the second and fourth best players for this other team are out and let's, you know, make a new prediction based on that. Like it's just too hard to kind of, you know, aggregate all that information for 358 teams. So, so that's the area where it, it, you know, I think it, it impacts the system, makes it, you know, perhaps a, a little bit less accurate for some of these teams where we just, you know, we just don't know who played in which game and, and how that might've affected a, a team's performance. Ken, it's great to catch up with you. We hope to see you in the Marriott Center soon. I'm sure you'll make your way down for uh, some of these top-tier West Coast Conference games. We'll save you a seat, man. All right, appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you guys. You got it. Ken Pomeroy, the college basketball stats guru with us on BYU Sports Nation.